want to get my screen up here and um, just run that. Happy with that? Can you guys see it or is it not shared yet? Not just yet. I'm sure it's just hang on for a second. I must just, I must, yep, now we will go. All right. Lovely. Okay. Better now. Yeah, that's fine, Chris. We can see that. That's brilliant. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity. Appreciate it, Can Project. Uh, Abby, thanks for the invite. What I'm going to do is just quickly go through a couple of contextual slides. Uh, and I would rather people ask questions uh, than trying to anticipate what people want to hear. So the whole idea is just to give you a broad overview of the project. Uh, it is very difficult to do it in 10, 15, 20 minutes of the whole history. But uh, let's crack on and see where we get. So I think that photograph is exactly what we're trying to do at the project, is to connect people with their local peatlands or wetlands or the environment. Uh, that's what we're trying to do there. So it's about 200 hectares site. Um, and uh, you can see that there's a lot of impact by humans there. There's a lot of drains. There's a lot of roads. There's a lot of uh, forestry. So a lot of issues in terms of the impact. And then we also have a quarry next to us. Uh, we have a town, a village, which is just on the northern end of the site. The old railway track that goes straight through it gives access, has its impact as well over the years in terms of uh, the subsiding of, of peat. Anyway, that's the site, 200 uh, hectares or 500 uh, acres in old money. So just another shot that gives you an idea uh, just on the raised bog area that you can see here is to see the drains that has been put into it in the mid 80s when Bord Namona, shortly after Bord Namona uh, bought the site from the local estate. Uh, but also subsequently, it, the drains were blocked. You can see these dots on these drains, which is P dams. That is the site, basically. There's about uh, 64 kilometers of drains on the Raysbog area, and there's about 3,000 plugs been put in in 2009. And then you see the, the boardwalk that goes across the site uh, for amenity. Right, so there's a couple of... Uh, just give you an idea of the broad type of habitats. Peatlands, uh, obviously, is, is one of the key areas. So there's the different habitat, uh, the, one of the key habitats that we're trying to look at. That's the Raysbog area, slightly um, being affected by the drains, which you can see there across the bog there, which is blocked. There's a pea dam there. There's another one just sticking out here on the side. There were a lot of cutaway areas around the place, which has been sort of uh, repopulated with various plant species, sort of creating different habitats over the time, which is also an indicator. If you look at the bracken, if you look at uh, the um, heather here, it is an indication that it is drier peat. Then we also have on the eastern side of the site, we have mineral water flowing into the site. Uh, and it creates different other uh, swamp woodlands, wet woodlands, uh, transition mires, all sort of different uh, habitats. So obviously this is all about species and a lot of these uh, biodiversity and species, especially insects that we are managing the site for. I'm just giving you a quick rundown, a quick overview. It's not comprehensive. But then let's get back to the community engagement. This photograph was taken in 2000 when we were all still young and fanciful and full of dreams when we blocked the entrance uh, for this machine of board Mona couldn't get in to go and do some further draining. Behind it here, you might see a piece of a crane that one of the local lads was uh, it was a bird enthusiast, brought the crane in to actually look at some exotic bird species that was uh, making a nest up in the trees around that area. The, unfortunately, this uh, crane broke down and it happens to be on the same weekend that Bord Namona wanted to move the machines on. Very unfortunate. But anyway, that's how the communication started with Bord Namona, that we want to secure this as a natural heritage amenity for the local community. Sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. 
In the meantime, since then, we've uh, secured a 50-year lease agreement uh, after about eight years of talking back forward and all sort of issues between us and Board Namona and European um, um, uh, made in, in case against Ireland, where this peatland or the transposition of European directors into Irish law wasn't questioned. And this bog or the Ablix bog was one of the sites that was quoted as an example where this transposition of European directors hasn't gone into Irish law correctly. Anyway, 2010, we signed a 50-year lease agreement, and then since then it became a community-led conservation project. We've done a lot of different events and workshops over the years, just to give you a sort of a flavor of that. We're also doing a lot of in infrastructure work, uh, putting in boardwalk, bog bridges, uh, doing vegetation management, building seats and stuff, as you can see here. Um, it is interesting that, especially since COVID, with the increased number of people, it put it a strain on the site in terms of its uh, amenity infrastructure. And we had to actually respond and upgrade and renew and uh, do alternative paths, spend a lot of time. It diverted us a little bit of the conservation work that has been done. There's a lot of stakeholder collaboration. Uh, these photographs, come, most of them were taken recently or this year. The one here in the middle is when we're part of uh, the wetlands, um, oh, sorry, um, in Horizon 2020 research project uh, called Waterlands. Uh, Abelix Bog is a knowledge site where we say how a multi-stakeholder collaboration can work towards restoration. And this was in May when about uh, all of these people, there was about 50 in total of them who came to visit the site. They from about 14 countries, 24 partners in the project uh, run by DCU. Um, then we recently just had some survey done by University College uh, Galway and also Trinity College um, that actually is doing, see how the changes since the beat um, the BOC Commissioner's uh, maps of 1809 that was uh, issued, how the change in the peat soils and the land use of peat soils uh, has taken place over the last couple of years. Just uh, Mosquito and Midges um, the research project that we involved with and some, some collection and then just uh, generally volunteering and uh, national volunteers. We also collaborate with the visual arts people, various projects, the local uh, educational center that is in town. They bring the art students there every year. There's also youth dance sessions. There's all sort of interesting stuff happening over time. Um, obviously, recreation and well-being is a big issue for us. Um, like I said, this photograph was taken before we extended it at the Bog Bridge, but did some yoga and some meditation from time to time as well. Uh, it's not always conducive to do it. We don't always have the weather in Ireland to do it, but it gives you a flavor of what the site is being used. And just here in the middle of COVID and uh, April 2021, we did a physical people count on one day and it was close as 588 people, I think, were from eight o'clock the morning till four o'clock the afternoon. We estimate another 200 because it was a wonderful day came afterwards and about 55 dogs. Um, the interesting thing, socioeconomic impact of the project. Um, we actually, this is the local hotel there, which is, is adjacent to our project. The hotel has always been good to us, always made available the hotel car park area for people to come when they want to go for a walk. And it's interesting that during COVID, when the hotel had to close in March of 2020, they saw that there's people coming daily for a walk. They saw an opportunity. They brought in a coffee dock uh, caravan and started to sell coffees and pizzas. And a year later, they started to develop a more permanent infrastructure. And even since this photographs were taken, there's now a new indoor structure being put in next to this container here which is can be all year round, uh, can open up with windows and stuff has just been completed in the last week or so. 
Then let's get back to what uh, the main aim of the project is, conservation, uh, rehabilitation. So in 2009, there was some money available from the National Parks and Wildlife Services with uh, himself, Jim, who's on this, has also tuned in today. He made money available for, for the blocking of drains on the site. So if you look at this area, this map here, the site has been sort of divided in the meantime in sort of hydrological zones of which B and C is the raised bulk area, which is dependent on, on precipitation or rain. And in 2009, the drains were blocked. I've already mentioned the 64 kilometers of drains, about 3,000 feet dams were put in, in the drains. Uh, that is where the whole thing started off in 2009. Then since then, we, we, looked, at, um, we looked at all the other areas, which is G, H, F, E, and D here around, it, around to see if there's all the cutaway areas, if there's any work or restoration work that we can do there. And we started in 2017 with a proposed restoration plan. That proposed restoration plan looked at all the, the possibilities of blocking all these drains. But before we could do any of the blocking of the drains, which you see in purple here or blue this side, was to actually test um, or just to go around to make sure that we don't impact any habitats or any species or anything that could be very important. And we've brought in ecologists to actually map each of these uh, hydrological sites to do it in, in micro habitats to actually give us a good flavor, a good understanding what is going on. And you find some very interesting habitats that is created like a petrifying springs, bog woodland, uh, some uh, transition mires, all sort of very interesting things that popped up. And out of this, uh, then apart from just doing uh, pea dams and, and drains, some areas were selected then to um, to actually to, to benefit from enhanced rehabilitation, which I will come a little bit later. In the meantime, what we've done is as community group, we've uh, uh, purchase some GNSS equipment or GPS uh, equipment, submeter accuracy equipment, to be able to do our own mapping and, and gather data, uh, GIS data as well, that we can help, uh, use for our own mapping. In this case, we mapped every single P dam that was done on the Raysbog area, which is represented here by a dot. And that was just the first quarter of it at the start. We've, in the meantime, have finished and completed every single PDAM recorded on a map. Okay, so that was the PDAMs and then uh, on the raised bog. And then, we, so the, the impact of that over the years, um, we've, in 2009, just to start back, we did a baseline survey, what they call ecotope surveys. Uh, where we try to see what is the status or the uh, how the bog is doing, the raised bog area uh, as a baseline. And the 2009, the majority of the area was still face bank, very dry, not in good condition. The ideal is to have these blue spots, which is uh, what they call sub-central uh, peatland, which is sort of nearly as good as you can get. The best is central, which is active raised bog. So that was 2009, and after, at the time of the blocking of the drains, 2014, we repeated it again, and then in 2020, it was repeated and then. And the picture is just totally different in 11 years, where we had only 1.5% in 2009, 4.5% more or less in 2014. Uh, we now have, at 2020 survey, we have approximately 13.5% active raised bog as it should operate and work. And that is just the impact of rewetting, doing nothing else. So it is a tremendous um, uh, rebouncing of the bog in the last 11 years. And using, using these different uh, ecotope areas, whether it's the dark blue, light blue, or the orange areas, each of them have a net carbon emissions or carbon sequestration value. 
uh, we were able then with a PhD study that took place is to correlate these different areas, whether it's central, subcentral, up to face bank, uh, and have a look then as to what is the net carbon emissions, not including methane or dissolved organic carbon. But if you have a look at the, at the oh, sorry, then I've gone too fast now. At the, at the screen here at the bottom end over the last uh, over the last 11 years you can see that how many how, how basically how much tons of direct carbon emissions has been reduced since the, the original 443 here. So that is an, that is another way of looking at the, at the situation. So then because of the success of that, I've mentioned that three areas were, and the ecological surveys, it was basically determined that these three areas could benefit from enhanced rehabilitation. And if you just look at this area and we go to the right here, enhanced rehabilitation is where you construct a continuous peat dam or a bund or a berm that actually creates cells and this is actually to avoid that you don't miss any cracks in the peat because there's been a harvesting of peat over the years, is just to make sure that you don't let any water off by creating these berms, which is about 50 centimeters high. And then on top of that, you put this, the scraw or the materials from around plant materials on top, just not to make it not drying out. And you combine that as well with, uh, with some P dams in the actual drains. So if, if you look at just doing P dams and you compare what the success should be if you just put in, if you combine that with berms or with, uh, with these buns, they look at the potential for form peat forming habitats. And just with the P dams, it was calculated about a 0.5 hectares of peat forming habitats with the enhanced restoration, we might get up to 5.5. That is the prediction. So we, we will only learn that in the next couple of years. This work has been carried out. This is the actual mapping of the, the, the berms and the buns that has gone on and the overflow points here and reds where that gets to a certain point, it overflow over from that area to the other area downstream. So this is the actual maps map that was done in the last week as well. So the work is completed, machines pulled out uh, last week and Wednesday. So interestingly enough, these are photographs taken since. And just to see here, you can actually see the berms or the buns on, on, the, on the ground that has been created. And just here, you can see on the edge, on this side here, just a further down, you can see the berm or the bund there, and you can already see the water table basically starting to form, or you can visible uh, on, on ground level, which is absolutely stunning to see it within two or three days. And the same with the other areas, you can already see that was within a day or two after the first berms were put in. There's another two subsequently put in in that area, but you can already see the water coming up here. And this photograph is taken, the machines moved out of this area uh, Wednesday, today, a week ago, and that photograph was taken a day or so before they left. So already you can see the impact of these berms that the water table is coming up. So that is that is basically uh, what the rewetting process are at the moment, and hopefully the success and uh, will be measured in the next couple of years to see what it is. But the restoration, all of these things don't go without the community involvement and multi-stakeholder involvement. And, and this is possibly the best statement I've ever seen about that is that ecosystem management is closely related to human well-being and should be integrated. And that uh, conservation is a very complex uh, process and con complex system. And it can't be done by just one person or one group, neither community led or government central government led is the answer we need to bring in people from all sort of walks and lives and, and uh, stakeholders together to work together that is the only way we can do it properly 
Second thing is as well that this science of environmental um, uh, research project actually find that where you were protected area, which is co-managed by a community and other conservation body or people, that you get better results, better and greater empowerment of local people, increased financial benefits and less uneven distribution of cost. And it is it, it, it benefits the whole biodiversity and it benefits the whole process just much better. And they, they've taken a review of about 160 scientific studies at the time. The last thing I want to say is that when you get communities involved, it is important that we address a lot of things here is that include communities in the in the procedures and decision making right from the beginning. The power relationships needs to be addressed in the participatory process. Some people have the money, other people have no decision. Other that so we need to balance all of these things. Uh, we need to have trust and accountability of all of these things. So governance is an important uh, issue. Then we need all the, the all the different stakeholders involved. We need to share, uh, challenge that existing silos of knowledge. And, and have interdisciplinary research and foster participation, and knowledge production. So basically that gives you a good overview and I would, any questions that you wanna ask, please do. I hope I give you a good overview, thanks. Um, could you just show us that um, the slide that had the carbon sequestration figures on it at the very bottom, unfortunately the actual up-to-date figure was blocked by the, the sharing oh, logo. Okay, yes. What oh, was that final to, figure? Okay, I need to, let me just bring it up here and I'll give it to you. Sorry, I, I, I couldn't read it myself. So <laughs> <laughs> it. The final figure was 208. And the original figure in 2009, if you look at what it was and what it now is, was 443. And then the 220 figure was 208. So the reduction in direct carbon emissions was more than about 52% thereabouts. Okay. That is sure that is very impressive. <laughs> and uh, one of the guys who worked it out that is equates about to about a, the the CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions of about 120 cars or so per annum. Yeah. So that's probably the, the number of cars. Well, not quite. I expect Abbey Leaks is quite a thriving wee place, but I'm sure there's more than 120 cars in it, but Absolutely. it's still a fair bite of it. Exactly. Yeah. But that's only two square kilometers. So so it just if, if you extrapolate that into the amount of peat soils we have in the country, just the yeah. potential of that. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, your linkages with other communities that you've built up as part of the Wetlands Forum? Yeah. So the other, the other, as, as part of the Abelix Bog project, we were instrumental in the start of the Community Wetlands Forum. Uh, the first meetings took place in about 2013. Initially, it was four or five community groups. And the reason was that you, when you start working on these projects, you work in silo. You work in silo and you also want to establish and, and learn from other people. But also, you need to have a, a, a bigger group to start talking and, and speaking to the powers to be wherever you are. So in the Community Wetlands Forum effectively came to be around 2015-16 when we constituted the, the Community Wetlands Forum, since grown that we now have uh, about 40, around 40 members, either community or individual members, and they all involved in wetland peatlands uh, from the ground up. We've also have, uh, we've also involved uh, with about two and a half people that is full-time employed now, uh, two and a quarter more or less people employed by the Community Wetlands Forum to actually build capacity, create a forum where we work with other stakeholders and share information, build capacity, uh, secured some funding from the Just Transition. And part of that process is just going to go on and on and on. And there was at one stage, we were talking even with the can project to facilitate the Northern Ireland branch or to get Northern Ireland communities involved in this project because of an all island project uh, or um, forum. And unfortunately, a lot of things were scuppered at the time with the COVID uh, as, as with a lot of other things. But anyway, yeah, that gives you an idea. 
Yeah, I know we have a couple of the cross-border sites, Sleeve Bay and um, Kulka, who would be very interested in in yes. in linking in with the, with that forum. And they are cross-border, so they've got Northern Irish and and Irish um, parts of their SACs that they'd be working on. But it's good to hear that it will spread all Ireland because biodiversity yeah. doesn't know borders, does it? So exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, that's really, it was, it was lovely to see that new work that's gone on since even since we were visiting. It was very, it's very interesting and I should be keeping a really close um, look on, on all the progress and I'm definitely coming down to visit again soon because I just had the best time. It was just lovely. Well, I'd, never, I'd never seen a comma butterfly before. So for me, that was just <laughs> the icing on the cake. <laughs> Um, so unless anybody else has got any questions, um, that, that this has just been a, a lovely short um, lunchtime session and I'm going to go and have a sandwich now. Um, so any feedback, um, gratefully received, just contact me um, through the CAN Project website. Um, CAN Project is now winding up. Many of our partners have now finished all their deliverables, um, but there'll still be people here um, delivering till the end of December and obviously our legacy work will carry on in the in the shape of a number of 27 SACs with much better um, outputs now um, and we've learned a lot from the project and we are looking towards uh, um, other projects that could be funded that would do similar work hopefully cross fingers through the Peace Plus program in the future so keep in touch with us and uh, and Abby, I, sorry, I see there's some question from Hayley or she has a hand up there. Yep. Hello. Um, hello. Thank you very much. Hi, Abby. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Long time no see. Um, thanks very much for that talk. It was very, very interesting. Um, I suppose, uh, you know, us from, from NIA are wondering if the recording will be shared because um, I think there would be a lot more people that would be interested in seeing this, but maybe mm -hmm. it just wasn't sort of sent yeah. around too widely or something. Yeah. Um, so definitely if the recording could yeah. be sent, we could share I, that I, I will be able to do that and it will go up on our YouTube channel um, okay. and I'll send uh, send the links to everybody who attended and the ones that booked and didn't attend and, and we will put it up um, and share it as widely as we can and it can be used by anybody who, who um, is interested in that. Yes, we have, we have a problem with GDPR if people have attended previous talks. We can't tell them about current talks because that's not why they signed up. So it's oh. really really difficult to build mailing lists in these days of you know not sharing <laughs> data oh, no, that's oh, strange no. yeah, it's, but I suppose, it's, yeah, it's, it's just really one of those awkward things, yeah it? yeah and um, so unless you can predict that you'll have a particular event on a particular date somebody who turn, attends or finds out about something or contacts us we can't just send out an email to them because their data is protected so oh, for goodness sake <laughs> yeah yes i know <laughs> <That's> annoying. <laughs> goodness sake. but it's yes, one of those will, things we will yeah. be trying to make it as popular as as widely available because um that information from chris is is invaluable and um, we'd love to see more people finding out about it so yeah definitely absolutely thank you okay okay so that's grand um and thank everybody very much and say goodbye thank you thank very you. much i think thank bye you bye-bye bye. 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 have a nice day yeah thanks